Today we're going to discuss ranking United States presidents. Uh, we've had 44 presidents, including President Trump, and uh, there have been many times um, throughout the last, say, 70 or 80 years, uh, in which there have been rankings of historians and political scientists uh, of these various presidents and uh, who's the best and who's the worst. And it's a nice parlor game, much the same as if you listen to sports radio, there's a constant question about, you know, who is the greatest quarterback of all time, or uh, is LeBron James uh, better than Michael Jordan? Uh, this kind of thing is also kind of a part of uh, our and interesting stuff when we talk about uh, you know, academics as well. So today we're gonna take a look at rankings of presidents, and take a look at some problems uh, with ranking presidents and why some of the time people don't really view these as being a legitimate exercise. And uh, also take a look at both the differences between academic rankings uh, and rankings of uh, by citizens in the United States. So C-SPAN, uh, I think, has one of the better um, ranking systems. Uh, I'm going to just show this video so that you can get an introduction to that. So which presidents were America's greatest leaders? C-SPAN recently asked 91 presidential historians to rate our 43 presidents in 10 areas of leadership. Top billing this year went to the president who preserved the union, Abraham Lincoln. He's held the top spot for all three C-SPAN historian surveys. Three other top vote getters continue to hold their positions, George Washington, Franklin Roosevelt, and Theodore Roosevelt. Dwight Eisenhower, who served in the Oval Office from 1953 to 1961, makes his first appearance in the C-SPAN top five this year. Now rounding out the historian's top 10 choices, Harry Truman, Thomas Jefferson, John F. Kennedy, and Ronald Reagan. Lyndon Johnson jumps up one spot this year to return to the top 10. But pity Pennsylvania's James Buchanan, he's ranked dead last in all three C-SPAN surveys. And there's bad news for Andrew Jackson as well. Our seventh president found his overall rating dropping this year from number 13 to number 18. But the survey had good news for outgoing President Barack Obama. On his first time on the list, historians placed him at number 12 overall. And George W. Bush moved three spots up on the scale to 33 overall, with big gains in public persuasion and relations with Congress. How did our historians rate your favorite president? Who are the leaders and the losers in each of the 10 categories? You can find all this and more on our website at cspan.org. So let's take a look at some of these rankings uh, and see how it works for the C-SPAN uh, poll. Uh, what I like most about this is they break it out into various categories, but let's just take a look at the overall scores. What we see is, uh, as far as the greatest presidents ever, is pretty much the top three in just about every list are the same. So Abraham Lincoln and George Washington generally are number one and number two. Uh, from time to time, Washington will flip over and become uh, number one. And uh, Franklin Roosevelt generally is in the top three, very rarely, you know, number one. That's usually reserved for, for Lincoln or for Washington. And, you know, of course, the reasons why those three are up at the top is because of the historical nexus at which they found themselves being president. Uh, so Abraham Lincoln obviously was successfully able to prosecute the Civil War. Uh, and uh, George Washington, well, maybe not having the great policy accomplishments of somebody like a Lincoln or a Roosevelt, was really the one that set all the precedents for presidents in the future years uh, and behaviors. And in many respects, uh, I think he gets top billing partially because of his career prior to becoming president, but also from the very fact that he was a president for the first time after being elected twice, turned power over uh, to somebody else. And that relinquishment of power uh, is certainly a, a huge part of American democracy and setting that precedent was very important. And then of course, Franklin Ro Roosevelt uh, was instrumental in building the New Deal uh, and dealing with the Great Depression, uh, as well as successfully fighting uh, World War II on two fronts. Uh, in the Pacific theater and in the European theater as well. So he almost always, uh, again, is up at the top. Now, after that, you see an interesting run here in which people jockey for position uh, year after year. Uh, 
So what was interesting in this poll uh, is that you saw that, that Eisenhower made it into the top five. Eisenhower for many years was seen to be a very weak leader, uh, but Fred Greenstein wrote a book called The Hidden Handed Presidency, in which he showed that Eisenhower liked to really behave behind the scenes, uh, and he would uh, not so much manipulate uh, his advisors, uh, but he'd work to get them to do the actual work for him while he kind of strategized. And what you saw after that book being released was that Eisenhower jumped up from being, you know, in the middle of the pack up to the top. Also, some of his kind of um, nonpartisan ways and kind of even-handed middle, middle of the road Republicanism uh, appeals to some of the people who take these surveys, which we'll talk about later. Um, as you go down to the bottom, you'll see at the bottom of this list, uh, pretty much the same people kind of fall in here all at the same time. James Buchanan, as mentioned, uh, was president, uh, the only president from Pennsylvania who was president, uh, pretty much presided over the beginning of the Civil War. And he almost always ranks uh, at the very bottom of this list. Uh, Andrew Johnson uh, was uh, one of only three presidents to be impeached, uh, along with uh, Bill Clinton and Donald Trump. Nixon resigned before he was impeached. Uh, and oftentimes some of the viewpoints of how he prosecuted Reconstruction also hurt him as well. Uh, and then Franklin Pierce was the president right before Buchanan. Uh, he kind of goes lockstep with, uh, with Buchanan as well. What we also see at the bottom here are a number of people uh, like a Harding uh, who had some um, you know, controversies during their administration uh, particularly in relationship to um, corruption and so forth. Uh, what's interesting as you look through here is that uh, Richard Nixon, uh, who is you know the only president to ever have resigned from office, has steadily started to rise through um, these rankings over the last several decades. Um, and you know when, when you took a look at polls back in the in the 80s and such, he was usually in the bottom three or four. Now you see he's moved up uh, to the top of the bottom third. So he's he's gaining some credence as well. Jimmy Carter also has been treated well with time, uh, partially because of what he did in his post-presidency, uh, I think more so than what he actually did while he was president. And Ford as well, uh, you know, Ford pardoning President Nixon probably cost him the election in 1976. But many people take a look at that action as being something that was a, a great act of moral courage, sacrificing his own political career really for the good of the nation. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, most of the people in the middle are people that happened to be presidents during times in which there wasn't a whole lot going on. Therefore, they couldn't really make their impact on the presidency. Now, what I really like about this, um, this C-SPAN poll uh, is that it takes into consideration a number of different characteristics which are then combined into this rubric uh, to give this scoring system. So they look at the characteristics of public persuasion, crisis leadership, economic management, moral authority, international relations, administrative skills, relations with Congress, vision, setting an agenda, pursued equal justice for all, and performance within the context of the times. So it's not just a favorability rating, it's actually a rating that is on a number of different scale items. And what's interesting here is as we go through here, you can see that you know, the presidents kind of jockey around here. So you know, Roosevelt becomes number one when we're talking about public persuasion. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt jumps up uh, from being number four, four uh, up to number two, uh, because his, uh, he, he was the great, you know, the instigator of using the bully pulpit. Reagan also is up there in the top five because of his communication skills. Uh, as we go down farther, uh, things like economic relations have an impact uh, on how presidents are perceived. So as we go through here, you see a president like George H.W. Bush uh, who for the most part is considered to be a kind of a middling president. I mean, he did lose his reelection battle in 1992, but he presided over essentially uh, the end of the Cold War uh, and is widely credited uh, with being able to uh, see the dissolution of the Soviet Union um, and to help them do that without uh, us actually having to get into any kind of hot wars or any, any controversies. 
I would set aside that there are uh, some interesting things here. Pursued equal justice for all is an interesting category because it does to some extent suffer from presentism. Uh, because depending on when you found yourself president, uh, the idea of equal justice wasn't really something the government was getting involved in. Uh, so obviously Lincoln's right at the top there uh, because he um, ended up through the end of the Civil War freeing the slaves. Um, Lyndon Johnson obviously presided over the Civil Rights and the Voting Rights Acts of 64 and 65. Um, and then you have some other presidents here at the top as well. Now, what's interesting, though, is that when you get down towards the bottom, uh, all of these presidents, for the most part, uh, were either prior to the Civil War or pretty close to the Civil War. Um, and you know, certainly James Buchanan, um, because of uh, his um, you know, uh, essentially siding for the pro-slavery forces, uh, is considered to be one of uh, the worst presidents uh, in that field. What you do see that's interesting here, and this is where, again, I mentioned this idea of people jumping up in different categories. Uh, Ulysses Grant, uh, because of uh, some of, particularly uh, because of uh, the corruption in his administration, was generally seen as being one of the worst presidents in history. But over time, people have reevaluated him and really shown that uh, while, you know, the era of Reconstruction uh, was, was uh, you know, pretty much uh, over. Uh, he uh, did do quite a bit uh, to be able to help African Americans, and that's why he kind of jumps up here in this equal justice for all. So there are all kinds of categories that are, are ranked here. Uh, if you're interested, you can go back and take a look at all presidents, uh, and you can pick out your favorite president and see where they fall on some of these lists. Um, you know, John Kennedy's always been one that's interested me uh, because, you know, essentially he was only president from 1961 until uh, November of 1963. Uh, so, you know, he, he was only president for a little under three years, and yet in many of these categories, he's considered to be, you know, in the top 10 uh, and, and, and above average. And, um, you know, some of those crisis leadership things weren't all that great. I mean, obviously he gets credit here uh, for the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, but what's not mentioned is the, you know, the Bay of Pigs fiasco. Um, so there, there are a lot of interesting things that go into these. So I advise if you get a couple minutes, take a look through here and poke around and see what you uh, can find. Now, this is a, a survey, many of the surveys have been done with historians um, over the years. Arthur Schlesinger uh, and his son, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. had done them for decades. Uh, one of the problems, I guess, when you're stuck in any single discipline is that there's a certain disciplinary mentality. What we've seen in recent years is that these polls have started to include historians, political scientists, economists, uh, to get a broader range uh, this is from the American Political Science Association. They did the survey in late 2017, early 2018. Uh, if you're interested in seeing more about this, you can click through here at the link up at the top uh, in the slides. Um, and what you see here is pretty much the same, uh, more or less, of what we saw um, when we took a look at the, the C-SPAN rankings, Lincoln number one, Washington number two, FDR three, um, Roosevelt four, uh, you see Eisenhower dropping down a little bit there. Uh, Jefferson oftentimes gets credit for his pre-presidency actions as opposed to his actual presidential actions. Um, but you do see uh, Reagan in the top 10. Uh, he's moved up a couple spots. Lyndon Johnson's moved up a couple spots. Uh, again, people focusing in more over historical time, less on the Vietnam War and more on what he did uh, with the Great Society programs and when it came to civil rights. Uh, as well. Um, and what's very interesting is, uh, again, thinking about when this is taken, we're a year and a half into the, the, the Trump presidency. And uh, as you see here, uh, Donald Trump finishes in dead last among these 170 people that were polled, uh, 170 political science scholars that were, were polled. Um, he finishes even behind Buchanan. Uh, so, that's very interesting that 
person with, at that point, so little history of being the president would be considered to be the worst president of all time. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a couple minutes. So here's our friend, James Buchanan. Um, our friend, because out of the 44 people, we've only had one person from Pennsylvania. What makes him the worst president? And is there anything salvageable from his presidency? So let's take a look at uh, uh, Buchanan's record here. James Buchanan was in this house when he was notified he won the election to the presidency. He Betty Nauman has been giving tours of Wheatland, the Lancaster, Pennsylvania estate of President James Buchanan for close to 30 years. The portrait of James Buchanan was done early in his campaign. It's a gorgeous home with one very special amenity. It has uh, two adult seats. Probably a seat for a teenager down there. and That uh, Wheatland's director, nice, Patrick uh, Clark, showed us. Oh my God, an outhouse for five. You could yes. have a whole cabinet meeting yeah, in here. a family that goes together. <laughs> but it's in the proverbial toilet where historians rank our 15th president. Oh, he's definitely the worst. The worst ever? The worst president ever. Robert Strauss wrote a book about Buchanan. Ah, oh, here's Buchanan. He's also got a cigar box filled with presidential action figures. Here's Jackson. You remember when they talked to each other? Oh, but Something. Jackson hated Buchanan, right? Jackson hated Buchanan. <laughs> of course, not everyone hated Buchanan. After all, he was elected president in 1856. But this Northern Democrat's sympathies with the slave-holding South exacerbated long-simmering tensions, setting the stage for the Civil War. Yet at Wheatland, they're not quite so hard on the guy. Where would you put James Buchanan in the ranking of the 43 men who have occupied the Oval Office? Probably 42nd. He uh, had opportunity to write a book. Don't they all write a book? If Buchanan is remembered at all, it's for being the bachelor president, the only one never to marry. Let's just get this out of the way right now. Okay. What was the deal with James Buchanan? He did have a bad relationship early on. His fiance probably committed suicide. Because he was gay? Well, <laughs> maybe so. There's no evidence to say that he was gay, but there's no evidence to prove that he was a heterosexual either. But there's plenty of evidence that he knew how to throw a great party. He threw the best party of the middle part of the 19th century, the inaugural ball. 6,000 people show up. And Buchanan seemed worth celebrating. Buchanan had quite a resume. The greatest of anybody who's ever run for president. He served in both houses of the Pennsylvania State Legislature, served in both houses of the U.S. Congress. He was an ambassador to Russia, ambassador to Great Britain. He was also secretary of state. There were high hopes at the beginning of his administration. I think so, but uh, they were dashed pretty quickly. Only two days after his inauguration, the Supreme Court handed down the infamous Dred Scott decision, allowing that escaped slaves be forcibly returned to their owners. Buchanan backed that decision. Slavery would be the country's and his undoing. He feared that if you handled the issue of slavery too robustly, that it would create what he believed would be the end of the Union, secession. And that's exactly what happened. After Lincoln's election, but before his inauguration, seven states seceded, while a politically paralyzed Buchanan presided. When all these states start seceding, when the country is falling apart, what is his reaction? His biggest reaction is his friends are leaving him because many of his cabinet are Southerners, many of his friends are Southerners. So his biggest reaction is a personal one, like, guys, I thought we were all friends. Yeah, I thought we were all friends. The ensuing civil war would become known as Buchanan's War. What does Buchanan get right? Well, what he gets right is not much, to tell you the truth. Upon leaving Washington, it is said that Buchanan told incoming President Abraham Lincoln, Sir, if you are as happy in entering the White House as I shall feel in returning to Wheatland, you are a happy man indeed.
He said to friends and family alike, I could well be the last president of these United States. Now, if you'll follow me. Still, at 91, Betty Nauman doesn't plan on abandoning Buchanan or his home anytime soon. I think this house keeps me young. Well, Chance Buchanan did something right. <laughs> So, just to give Pennsylvanians a little hope that there might be something salvageable in Buchanan's presidency, um, here's another uh, scholar from the Buchanan Library uh, who gives us a little inkling of something that might be, um, might be useful uh, to glean from this presidency. Greatness, it's hard to define. What qualities truly make a person eminent and distinguished? Today we're looking at the legacy of President James Buchanan. As the only American president born in Pennsylvania, some would say Buchanan ranks among the greatest of Pennsylvanians. And yet historians regularly rank him among the worst of our nation's presidents. Was Buchanan truly such a terrible president? Or is he instead a misunderstood and underappreciated man of greatness? One thing was certain. I have no idea. To find out, I went to Buchanan's home of Wheatland in Lancaster to talk to historian Stephanie Townrow. You know, James Buchanan was somebody who really made Pennsylvania proud. He was a great businessman in Lancaster. He was a real philanthropist. He gave money to many churches in downtown Lancaster. He was an excellent Secretary of State under President Polk. He was a foreign ambassador to both Russia and England. Uh, he was in the Senate and the House of Representatives. Ultimately, he was a really fine statesman. A fine statesman. So far, so great. But how did he do? as president. On a scale of one to 10, if you had to give him a numerical job approval rating, where would you, where would you land for James Buchanan's presidency? I'll give him a two. A two, not great. The presidency was the one thing that he did not excel at, in part because of the timing. He became president in 1857 when the country was really already split over the issue of slavery, and it was uh, very difficult for him to be an effective president, and in fact he wasn't uh, a very effective president. In his inaugural address, he said he would only serve for one term, but there's very little doubt in my mind that he probably wouldn't have won. Buchanan's vice president, John Breckinridge, ran for president right after Buchanan but so did Stephen Douglas, and they really split the Democratic Party. Would it be safe to say that we can thank James Buchanan for the election of Abraham Lincoln? In many ways, that's true. Certainly, it did help the Republican candidate, who was Lincoln, uh, win. Absolutely. So that could potentially be a vote in his favor for his legacy, right? Sure, that's one way of looking at it. Inadvertently aiding a rival politician to become president wouldn't normally be a sign of greatness. But when that president is Abraham Lincoln, we might just make an exception. With a mixed legacy in public service, we had to look at the bigger picture of Buchanan's accomplishments. Thankfully, Wheatland was the site of one of Buchanan's most notable and innovative achievements. So we're here uh, at kind of a special building on our property at Wheatland. We're here in front of James Buchanan. Okay, I don't think we need to see the outhouse again. Uh, but what you can see from that is that uh, I guess the only thing positive about his uh, presidency was that Buchanan was so incompetent uh, as president that he gave rise to the greatest president of all time, uh, which was Abraham Lincoln. All right, let's take a look at some of the criticisms of these types of rankings. And I've got some polling data and various other things to show you as to how this all works itself out. Um, however, um, one of the things uh, as we go through here is that there's a certain ideological bias of scholars uh, to these rankings and um, what we've seen over, over almost all of time period is that most of these scholars uh, have been uh, liberals and Democrats uh, from academia and that does give a bias to the outcomes of a lot of these surveys and I'll show you some, some stuff about that in a couple minutes. A second is that uh, some people argue that because we're trying to rank presidents really on their accomplishments, accomplishments, we are uh, have a, a predisposition towards activist presidents as opposed to presidents who don't believe 
the president should be very active in their role as president. And these kind of two different visions of the constitutional rights of a president uh, tends to give uh, you know, a bias towards those people who have accomplished a lot, as opposed to those people who believe that the office of the president should be secondary to Congress. Another thing that some of these studies uh, uh, kind of suffer from is the idea of presentism. Uh, and this works two ways. One is uh, a lot of presidents, uh, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of these rankings tend to rank uh, recent presidents much higher because they're more in the mind of scholars and of the public. We'll see that in a couple of minutes. Uh, and then second also, some of the values uh, that we currently hold are imposed on presidents from the past. Um, and this is, for example, the idea of civil rights. Um, you know, some of the presidents, as we saw uh, in, in the uh, C-SPAN rankings, you know, probably go up and down based on their attitudes towards civil rights. Um, and also, there's this predisposition, again, when we look at this presidentism, towards 20th century presidents. And partially, this is because, starting with Abraham Lincoln, but really, kicking in with Theodore Roosevelt and finally emerging in what we call the modern presidency of Franklin Roosevelt in 1932, uh, is really the notion that the president is uh, the primary source of uh, leadership within the United States. And we've had very activist presidents, Republicans and Democrats, uh, since Franklin Roosevelt and there's a predisposition then towards seeing these presidents as being better and having more accomplishments. So when we take a look at that list, you'll see you know, quite a few other than say Washington and Jefferson, maybe Adams, um, uh, the presidents uh, are from, from the last century. Uh, again, just thinking in terms also of Lincoln being the greatest president, uh, so he is an outlier as well. Another thing is that you know, these rankings kind of rise and fall, individuals rise and fall sometimes on the hottest new research that's coming out. Uh, I mentioned, for example, the idea uh, of Eisenhower and the hidden handed presidency, moving him from the middle of the pack up to the, you know, towards the top. Uh, that was because of Greenstein's book. There's been recent books about Ulysses Grant, uh, as I also mentioned that uh, give more credence to his civil rights activities during his presidency, which have increased his rankings as well. George H.W. Bush uh, has also started to become uh, being seen as, as, uh, a, as a better president because of some tough choices that he made while he was president, uh, including his breaking the no new taxes pledge uh, in order to, to kind of uh, give us a, a, a better budget going forward which really led ultimately probably to the balanced budget during the Clinton administration. So we tend to reinterpret all these presidents given new research, and that's not such a bad thing, but oftentimes that research is looked through the vein or the presentism of that specific time. Uh, and uh, some presidents uh, don't get any credence because of that. And then finally, when we talk about some public polling, which I'll show you in a minute, um, you know, the public basically doesn't have much knowledge of American history, and I think we all know that. And one of the problems is that in almost every one of the cases where we have public polls, uh, usually very recent presidents rise to the top of these categories with a smattering of Lincoln and Washington thrown in. But you know, suffice it to say that very few people know who James K. Polk was, uh, you know, or really into the details of Calvin Coolidge's presidency. So. You know, it's difficult for people to rank these that aren't scholars, but the problem is once you have the scholars ranking them, they are not, uh, for that matter, kind of indicative of the American public. So let me just take a look here uh, at the APSA survey that I made reference to a little bit earlier. There are 170 respondents to this APSA survey. 57% of those people describe themselves as Democrats, 13% Republican, 27 Independent, and 3% other. So this kind of shows you the bias within the discipline of political science. Although I would say probably it's not as bad as within the field of history, um, but it is very biased. And what we've started to see these surveys do is break people out by ideology um, and see where, where their rankings fell. So, on all of these lists, at least on uh, the Democratic and the Independent list, um, Lincoln falls number one, Washington falls number one, 
uh, for, um, for Republicans. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, typically number three. Uh, what you'll see also here is that uh, Ronald Reagan, obviously, as being kind of uh, you know uh, an icon of the right, is number five for Republican scholars, number seven for independents, uh, but then falls down to 14 among Democrats. So you see a little bit of ideological bias there. At the same time, take a look at President Obama. Uh, he ranks as number six all time for Democrats, number 12 all time for independents, uh, and number 16 all time for Republicans. Uh, so there, there is a lot of ideological bias here depending on you know, what your politics are. Lyndon Johnson is another president that's kind of you know, mixed match here. Um, you know, H.W. Bush uh, is moved around a bit there. Um, George W. Bush finishes at number 30 for Democrats, uh, but 23 for Republicans. Uh, and obviously, as you can see here, um, we can take a look at the final uh, worst president of all time uh, for Democrats. It is Donald Trump, uh, but Republicans don't have too much for him either as he finishes number 40. Um, so a lot of this is, is affected by uh, your ideology. Uh, what's also interesting here is, according to the APSC survey, they asked these scholars who they thought the next president should be that would be on Mount Rushmore. And <clears throat> again, we see the differences here uh, on the basis of partisanship. So, uh, you know, Franklin Roosevelt's the biggest one um, that's not on uh, Mount Rushmore. And uh, certainly, um, as a consequence of that, you know, everybody kind of thinks that he should be on there. He's in the top three of everybody's categories. Uh, but, you know, 11% uh, of Democratic scholars believe that Barack Obama should be on Mount Rushmore. Um, and, you know, 19% of Republicans said Ronald Reagan uh, and James Madison, uh, really kind of one of the icons of American uh, politics, more so for his job uh, prior to becoming president, uh, rounds all these things out. What about public opinion? Uh, this is from a survey taken by YouGov uh, at, at the beginning of 2020, uh, and people were asked to rank their best president uh, in history, and we see the difference here between Republicans and Democrats. 30% of Republicans believe that Donald Trump is the greatest president in American history, uh, followed by Ronald Reagan, George Washington, Lincoln, George W. Bush, and then 3% say Obama. On the other hand, Democrats favor their own as well, uh, with Obama being uh, the best president, according to them, 23%, uh, followed by FDR, Lincoln, JFK, Washington, and Bill Clinton. So again, here you see this idea of presentism, uh, not really knowing American history too much. Um, now, this is a separate YouGov poll uh, that had um, People compare Donald Trump to other Republican presidents. And uh, this is interesting as well. So this is all Americans, Republican, Democrat, independents. 69% uh, favor Eisenhower over Trump. 63% uh, uh, George H.W. Bush over Donald Trump. 62% W. Bush over Donald Trump. 59% uh, Gerald Ford over Trump. And here's the kicker. The only president to ever have resigned from office in American history, people favor Richard Nixon, uh, 56 um, to, uh, to, to 44 percent over Donald Trump. So in the American public's view, uh, even Richard Nixon's a better president uh, than Donald Trump. But let's take a look at this in a little bit more detail. Here's uh, Republican views and Democratic views comparing Donald Trump uh, to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, on the left, you see Democrats almost overwhelmingly say that uh, Abraham Lincoln was a better president, as to independents. But a majority, and I believe this is 53%, 53% of Republicans say that Donald Trump was a better president than Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and the same holds true here among Republicans when you're examining uh, uh, Donald Trump versus other uh, Republicans in recent memory. 
Uh, and you know, you'll see that the only president that's a Republican that really is considered to be a better president than Donald Trump is Ronald Reagan, uh, McCain, Eisenhower, both Bushes, Ford, and Nixon uh, are all uh, come in second place in a head to head matchup with Donald Trump. Um, so, again, this idea of presentism, living in the moment, evaluating in the moment. And then finally, um, I'd also like to just say that part of people's uh, vision of who good presidents and bad presidents are uh, has to do with the time periods that they've lived through. Um, so if you take a look at um, this poll done uh, about two years ago by the Pew Research Center, uh, you'll find um, that you know recent presidents are considered to be among the greatest uh, in, our, in our lifetime. Uh, so Trump, Obama, Bush, Clinton, uh, Reagan, all among the top people there. Um, but what you'll see is a vastly different opinion depending on when you were born and under which president that you grow up in. Uh, so our, those kind of formative years have an impact on us as who we see to be the greatest presidents. So you can see that there's a difference between millennials who see Obama as being a great president uh, versus Gen Xers. Uh, who also believe Obama was a great president, but there's also a strong predisposition towards Ronald Reagan. The same with the boomers with Reagan um, and uh, the silent generation uh, looks to the past when they were younger and look at people like Kennedy and Eisenhower with a different light uh, than with people that are younger. And I think part of this is also, well, I don't have any empirical proof from this, uh, just from informal interactions with other academics and political science and historic historic historian communities uh, is that oftentimes this kind of bias of when we grew up and when we were political socialized and the experiences that we've had during presidencies in our formative years also has a bias towards uh, the way people rank things and I think slowly you know Nixon was really low on most of the charts but I think as the Nixon era academics started to retire, Nixon has been able to move up because people didn't live through the Nixon years, they moved through the arch of history. So these are some of the interesting things that occur when we study uh, presidential ranking systems. Uh, so I encourage you to take a look at uh, some of these ranking systems and figure out who you think is the best and who might be the worst in your eyes.